Welcome everyone. My name is Susan Dernan and I am the administration lead of the Mississauga Arts Council. I would like to thank you for attending tonight's TD Culture Lab webinar, pitching your music to industry partners and concert promoters with Ryan Warner and Jesse Mitchell from Canada's Music Incubator. Tonight's webinar is presented by Mississauga Arts Council in partnership with Canada's Music Incubator. TD Culture Lab is generously sponsored by TD Bank Group. The Mississauga Arts Council is dedicated to enabling the growth of the arts by creating opportunity and connection between artists and residents in Mississauga and beyond. Celebrating our milestone 40th anniversary this year, the Mississauga Arts Council is a registered charity dedicated to accelerating progress toward the attainment of our vision of Mississauga as a vibrant cultural community where arts and culture thrive. We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe Chippewa, Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Great, let's get started. We're thrilled to present tonight's webinar, Pitching Your Music to Industry Partners and Concert Promoters. Mac would like to thank our presenting partner for this webinar, Canada's Music Incubator. Canada's Music Incubator is a not-for-profit organization specializing in professional development, ongoing mentorship, and live events for artists, managers, and music companies. Launched in 2012, CMI supports one, over 1,000 emerging music entrepreneurs of all genres in the development of long-term careers and sustainable businesses. CMI has provided over 10,000 hours of professional development programs and one-on-one -on -one mentorship combined. CMI's live events department works with private and community partners across the country, curating paid performance opportunities for artists. To date, CMI has programmed over 500 shows and paid $1 million directly to artists. CMI also advocates for the music sector infrastructure development and creative entrepreneurship education in high schools. Learn more at canadasmusicincubator.com. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to your webinar presenters, Ryan Warner and Jesse Mitchell. Ryan Warner has been a member of the CMI team for the past six years. He is currently the Director of Programs and acts as the lead artistic mentor for CMI's core programs, various custom programs, as well as online mentorship. Joining the company with a background in artistry, audio engineering, education, and academia, Ryan is regularly working to expand and refine all CMI programming to reflect the real world needs and challenges of artists and artist managers. Ryan holds a BA in English Literature with a minor in Popular Music Studies from Carleton University and an Audio Engineering Certificate from Recording Arts Canada. He is Juno Awards Delegate, Music Ontario Talent Committee member, adjudicator for Canadian Country Music Association, former content contributor to Weird Canada. Jesse Mitchell has acted as Director of Programs and Live Events at Canada's Music Incubator since 2012, overseeing the development and execution of all professional development programming, while guiding the evolution of CMI's Live Events Department, the organization's newest service offering, which focuses on connecting emerging artists with paid performance opportunities across Canada. Jesse has worked in the Canadian music industry for over 20 years with an extensive background in artist management tour management, and festival management. Jesse also acts as the co-manager of Canadian rock artist Kim Mitchell. Jesse holds a Bachelor of Business Commerce with a minor in marketing from Ryerson University. During university, he played for the Ryerson varsity basketball team and produced all the university's Frash Week events. Take it away, Ryan and Jesse. All right, hi, thanks, Susan. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. I see we've got uh, 30 participants here, so minus administrators are probably around 25, so that's that's a solid group. Um, my name is Ryan Warner. I'm the Director of Programs at CMI. Uh, my colleague Jesse Mitchell, he'll introduce himself in a moment. Uh, but yeah, we're here tonight to talk about pitching ourselves uh, to industry, and uh, we'll get a little bit more into that um, as once we get into the content of our presentation. Uh, but yeah, just a little about me. Um, 
artist, uh, creative, creative type person who has experience performing shows, booking gigs, uh, doing kind of doing all the bits that, uh, that an artist entrepreneur would do. Uh, I've also been with CMI for seven years, uh, helping to develop the programming uh, for through the lens of an artist. Uh, so trying to make sure that what we're talking about is uh, not only helpful to artists, but resonant with artists as well. Um, so we're going to talk about pitching ourselves. I'm going to talk uh, kind of broadly about approaches to pitching and email pitching. Uh, and Jesse is going to get specifically into uh, the gig world because Jesse is a... Uh, a maestro when it comes to the world of gigs and bookings. Uh, Jesse, do you want to quickly introduce yourself before we begin? Sure. My name is the maestro, Jesse. No, I'm just joking. My name is <laughs> Jesse. Uh, I'm the director of live events at CMI. Uh, if, if anybody isn't aware, I'm, I'm pretty sure just seeing all the names and we're seeing a lot of familiar faces, but for, for anybody that's not aware, Canada's Music Incubator, we're a, a national non-for-profit based here in Toronto. Um, and we specialize in, in professional development uh, for artists and music professionals like managers, promoters, uh, all of the above. So we're here uh, to act as mentors, give some experience that we've had um, and uh, answer any questions that you might have as well. And as Ryan mentioned uh, on the CMI side, we do program and curate a lot of events. We're not uh, promoters. We're definitely not agents. We, we like to call ourselves curators. So between all the partners um, through CMI and all the people that we work with, a lot of people just know us as um, working with a lot of artists across Canada, uh, a lot of artists in different genres, different places across uh, the country, uh, and, and also working with a lot of different managers across the country. So through that, a lot of people just connected with us and started reaching out for programming. Hey, Jesse, or hey, CMI, we're looking for a flamenco artist in BC. We're looking for an indigenous artist out in Nova Scotia. We're looking for this type of artist, that type of artist. And, and it just so happened that we, had been already working with so many artists that we probably knew the right artists, or if we didn't, we were working with managers who were already tied into that community or we're working with their clients who knew them. So that's kind of how it started. Uh, we've been doing that for probably about four or five years now. Uh, this year, we're going to mark um, a great milestone where uh, we're about to hit a uh, million dollars worth of revenue uh, in the pockets of artists across Canada uh, for the events that we've curated. Uh, and uh, and the only other thing I would say about CMI live events is we do not take any commission or uh, fee from the artist. Um, if there is any sort of fee or commission that we require, we always take it out of the actual um, program or client. Uh, we, we do not take it from the artist. Uh, we always make sure the artist gets paid and they, uh, they keep, uh, they keep all that. So looking forward to chatting with you. Uh, Ryan's going to get started, uh, yeah. and I'll finish it off, but, uh, otherwise, uh, if you want to get started now, right? Yeah, we can get started. And I would just echo, uh, what, what Susan has said. If anyone has questions, uh, please throw them into the chat. Uh, I, I would, uh, I know Jesse and I would much rather speak to your specific concerns than to broadly sort of speak at you for 90 minutes. So please, if anyone does have questions, uh, don't be shy. But uh, I think that we're good to start. So, um, Kate, you know, Kate, I will do, so I'm pulling a, pulling a lateral already from the beginning. I will do uh, the screen share for my for my part of the presentation, Kate. No worries. Okay. Good. All right. So let me just try to rearrange my screen a little bit so I can see a few of the blocks. So we're we're talking tonight about uh, pitching, elevator pitches, email pitches, um, a pitch. What is it? It really is. It's an ask. Right, and if you've ever watched a show like Dragon's Den or Shark Tank, um, you know that's that's kind of what we're talking about: is putting yourself in front of, you know, potentially strangers or people that you would like to do business with, and uh, presenting yourself in a way that, you know, can either help to land you a gig or to get a conversation started, um, to start building relationships. Um, and the way that a lot of these relationships uh, happen in our industry is initially through a pitch. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the elevator pitch first and foremost. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, can anybody throw in the chat like what, like what is an elevator pitch? What is it? 30 seconds to explain what you got. 
yeah that's that's a that's a great uh that's a great uh, that's a great uh start so that's a big part of it you pitch your product in the speed it takes to go up an elevator that's the idea okay so really when we talk about this in the music realm we're really talking about communicating who we are and what we do to others in the time that it takes to go up and down an ele- up or down an elevator rather i should say and you know, at first blush, this might seem like a very easy thing to do, right? Oh, I know who I am. I know what I can say. Uh, but I feel confident that if I was to ask someone to turn on their screen and turn on their mic and, and pitch me, uh, they may uh, they may start out good, but they may they may not end so strong. Um, and that's no disrespect to anyone. It just is a thing that that requires a bit of skill. Now. When we're talking about the elevator pitch, sometimes, you know, people don't really know what what is important information, what is uh, what is relevant information. So, I think the the place where I would start to kind of get our mindset aligned is around this question, right? If you've played music and you've been in venues or you've gone around, more than likely you have gotten this question in some type of uh, in some type of format. Um, um, so you're a musician. What type of artist are you? What's your music like? So when it comes to pitching ourselves, or more specifically, Pitching yourself to industry, introducing yourself to people in the industry, there are some things that I would encourage you to consider. Now, what are they? Okay, so first, you want to try to clearly communicate who you are, okay? And quite simply, this this is your name, okay? It's funny, it might seem very simplistic, pardon me. But a lot of the time when uh, people get nervous or they get excited or they're revved up or whatever, they just like, they think this is my opportunity to introduce myself to this person. I'm just going to go right in and tell them who I am. And they entirely neglect to actually introduce themselves. Okay. The, The one thing that I would really like everyone to take away from this workshop tonight is that this is an industry of people. Okay. I think sometimes we see the music business as this giant monolith that cannot be penetrated and it's, you know, it's full of just like scoundrels and and whatnot, but that's that's not the case. It is a, it's an industry that's, that's populated by people who care about music, who care about artists and want to see an industry thrive. Um, So don't be afraid of, of actually being a person yourself when you're introducing yourself to someone so you should clearly communicate your name okay that could be your 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 legal name that could be your stage name whatever you're comfortable with um you should also try to communicate where you're from are you coming from toronto are you from winnipeg where you may be uh like um like susan from uh, miss sarga arts council born in winnipeg then came to toronto um, does anybody have an idea why why we might say this is an important detail when you're when you're introducing yourself to someone who's working in the music industry? Any ideas on why it might be important to identify? Yeah, here we go. It's coming in the chat. Chat time. Different cities have different scenes and sounds. Yeah, there's a part of that. Local connections. Yes, Susan, that's a good one. Any other ideas why you might want to uh, introduce um, who you are and where you're from? Fan base. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, this is where you are doing business. I'm going to tell you um, most, probably the most important reason why you should introduce where you're from is that People might connect with something from your background that they like potentially, but but what it is for me and for Jesse is likely the same is that when if I'm if I'm in the industry and you're you're introducing yourself like say I'm an agent or I'm a manager or I'm a talent buyer like Jesse's going to talk about later, where you're from and where you're working working out of is is just one of these details that will help me think about potential opportunities for you. 
oh, you're you're based out of Mississauga. Do you know, are you connected with the Mississauga Arts Council? What's your relationship there? It's just, these are things that can start to facilitate a conversation to kind of keep, uh, to kind of grease the wheel, so to speak. But, but most importantly, from my perspective, it's to allow someone to assess if there are potential opportunities, right? If you're, if I'm a booking agent and you tell me you've been in Toronto for five years, but you've also spent um, five years in Alberta, well, okay, then there's a potential for two markets, a Toronto market in Ontario, an Alberta market, maybe Calgary, Edmonton, uh, and this could be an opportunity for me. So that's a, that's a reason to think about why you should include where you're from. Uh, further to that, identify the type of artist that you are. Are you a solo artist? Uh, do you perform in a group? Do you have a live band? Do you perform to tracks, right? Like if I was to go see you live, what would it what would the show look like um you know and the same can be true if you are an artist that maybe has multiple configurations i have a solo setup i also have a duo show and i have a full band show again again these details are going to help me as someone in the industry kind of identify potential opportunities right for you um okay perfect um the type of music that you make right? The sound of your music. What's it sound like? What's the genre? Um, and I will, I will say this on genre, because this is a question that comes up a lot. Um, is that like, I don't have a genre. I'm, I'm genre fluid. I do a little bit of this and I do a little bit of that and I do a little bit of the other thing. That's great. And that's totally fine. Um, but for someone who is, um, for someone who is working in the music industry, Having a kind of a broad sense of what you are, are you rock, are you folk, are you hip hop, are you R&B, are you electronic, right? Whatever that kind of broad genre is, it's, it's a good thing for you to be able to speak to, because, uh, beca uh, sorry, I can't seem to speak tonight. Um, it's a good thing to think to about because Again, it's going to allow me to assess for opportunities. Okay, this is an R&B artist. Okay, so they're working in the R&B field. Who are their contemporaries? Who are their kind of competitors on a higher level? Um, all these things are kind of framing you and your business as we get to speak. Um, as well, I would consider uh, musical reference points. And that was something that Adina did that I thought was quite good uh, because I, uh, this is my first time, you know, meeting the artist. Um, admittedly, I have not heard the music of the artist, although I've heard that she's written a great song that won an award. Uh, but by mentioning um, Phoebe Bridgers and Andy Schauf, um, I, being aware of who those artists are, I can assume that Adina's music is going to be kind of on the indie, indie folk side. Um, it's probably going to be somewhat on the more gentle side, and it's probably going to have a focus on lyrics and storytelling. Um, so again, sometimes people are shy and they don't want to include, <laughs> all right, right on. Um, some people don't want to include who their influences are because you know, we, we're artists and we're creative people and we, and we want to uh, sustain ourselves on the thought that like everything that we do is 100% unique. No one else has ever sounded like me. No one else has ever written a song like me. And that is true to a point. But in the realm of the business, it's okay to have some, some sort of touch points for people who have maybe never come across your music before, but if they're like, I like who you're influenced by, I'm gonna check you out. So that could be a thing to consider when you're putting, when you're doing an elevator pitch. And then finally, I think about differentiators, okay? What's unique about you or what's interesting, right? Um, the, the reality is, is that in the music industry today, um, the music is obviously the most important part of what we do, but there also is an element of storytelling, right? Who is this artist? What's their background? What are their values? What are the things that they care about? So if you are able to speak to maybe some things that separate you from 
maybe other artists in your scene or other artists who um, you may have an influence, be influenced by, you know, that that is a thing that, um, that you know, someone like a marketer, someone like a promoter, um, really anyone could, can use that insight to help help you make decisions, uh, make choices related to maybe marketing and promotion and whatnot. So having a degree of self-awareness of to who you are and what you do is very helpful. So, you know, again, not, not to focus this whole chat on, on Adina, but like, you know, something that I would encourage her to consider is like, if my influences are artist X and artist Y, wonderful are there ways that I am different from those artists as well, rather than being a carbon copy? Okay. So in terms of the elevator pitch, again, just to summarize, you should clearly, clearly communicate who you are, right? What's your name or what's your band's name? Where are you from? What type of artist are you? Do you perform to tracks? Do you perform with a live band? What's the configuration? Tell me about your music. Give me some reference points. OK, because I, I may not be the most familiar with your genre. I may not be the most familiar with your sound, but I may know who you're influenced by. And that can help me to sort of pull everything into focus about who you are. And then finally, think about the things that uh, might set you apart and be a little bit of a differentiator. OK, right. So can I add, can I add one thing? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, and this doesn't really relate too much. It, it does relate to elevator pitches, but uh, just based on this list, I always like to challenge artists or, or managers that are speaking on behalf of their artists that you should be able to pretty much say all six of these in one sentence if, if, you, if, if you're good at it. And maybe not all six, but you should be able to um, hit off a good four or five out of these six in one sentence. Uh, and I, I would challenge everybody to practice that because you are going to be in situations where maybe you're not in an elevator pitch, but you're just introducing yourself as an artist really quickly in one sentence and, yeah. and, and being able to do that. So for example, I saw Sammy Jackson joined uh, and a perfect example of Sammy Jackson would be, hi, my name is Sammy Jackson. I'm a Mississauga based jazz artist uh, that just recently won a Juno nomination. Right. At that point, just in one sentence there, I said who I was. I said the city I was from. I said the genre and I kind of said a differentiator. So I got four out of the six right there. And it was pretty easy right off the top of my head. Yeah. Right. So you should challenge yourself to be able to kind of answer that question in one sentence. Uh, but as, in a, as far as an ele elevator pitch, the good thing is you do have a couple more sentences than one. But it's, it's good practice to even just start with one sentence, I find. Absolutely. Thank you, Jesse. And, and to that. Elevator pitches should be conversational, right? Not robotic. Because I know that a lot of you are potentially looking at that list that I ran down and you've made a note for each and you're ready to be like, hello, my name is this and I am that and blah, 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 blah. But that's, that's what you might do when you're getting warmed up, when you're starting. But really, we want to get to a point where we're comfortable and we can be conversational about what we're doing. And I think one thing to remember is that if we're elevator pitching, right, that means we're doing it with a person kind of face to face. We're meeting them maybe where they're at a club or a conference or, you know, some chance encounter uh, face to face um, that you, you really are not you're not trying to, like, make a deal immediately in your pitch. You're really just trying to get a conversation started. You're trying to get a bit of rapport. You're trying to get someone interested in what you're doing. Okay. So your pitch should be conversational, not robotic. It should feel natural and not scripted, right? It should feel like you're not trying to rhyme off a laundry list or a shopping list uh, for that matter, right? You, you, you want to practice it to the point where you can comfortably, you know, speak about who you are and what you do and why you're special. Okay. And finally, um, your elevator pitches should be customized to the individual or a group that you might be addressing. So, you know, if you think about Dragon's Den or Shark Tank, you know, uh, the people that go on there and make those pitches, they are pitching to investors. 
right? So the mindset of the people making those pitches are like, okay, I'm going to have to speak to the business of this so that I can entice an investor to come into my business. And for us in the music business, um, you know, there, there may be an investor, but more likely it's going to be someone who's booking gigs, someone who might do grant writing, someone who's maybe a manager. Um, hell, it could be other people that maybe you want to have join your band, right? And so with each of those, you are going to speak in a way that's going to resonate with those individuals. And Jesse will get more into that uh, in, in his part of the presentation. Uh, but again, I think just as a general rule, know your audience, right? Know who you're speaking to and know what's important to them, okay? Customize to the individual. Okay. Now, before I go on to the email pitch, I'm curious, are there any, any questions on elevator pitching? No? Okay. I'll just make one comment, uh, Ryan. And sure. what I find in elevator pitches, I, I, I like how you stress that uh, you want it to be conversational because a lot of the time in the elevator pitch, you're not going to confirm anything. You're not going to seal the deal. Uh, honestly, when I'm doing elevator pitches, I'm just trying to build a connection so I can send an email with more details or send an email or somehow try and schedule a follow-up phone call or another meeting where we can actually like truly discuss it. Yeah. Um, it's almost like fishing with elevator. So you're just trying to get like a bite, a bite. and that's really all you're trying to get. Yeah. Um, that's what I find. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I would add, and that's a, that's a great point, Jesse. And, and one thing that we, you know, we're, it's funny, we're, we're, we're a professional development organization that like, I feel like we often like deal in analogies and metaphors. And uh, one that we often use in terms of relationship building in the music business uh, is that of a parallel to a romantic relationship, right? Like if you want a manager, if you're looking for a label or an agent, you're not going to I mean, maybe you would, but I would assume that most people wouldn't be like, hey, I'm Ryan, I need a manager, let's get married right away. Let's sign a contract and let's get married right away. Um, that might be someone's choice, that might be their approach, but generally there's gonna be a dating phase and there's gonna be a trial period and you're gonna want to kind of test the waters and build that relationship out before you commit to anything uh, that might be in a contract, right? So if you think about relationship building in that context of like, I just wanna get this person to talk to me, or I wanna, I would just love to go on a date, like a professional date with this person. Um, that mindset can, can kind of improve the, it can reduce the stress that comes from a expectation because if you're like, say, meeting a manager for the first time, your mind is like, I, they got to be my manager. I got to get them to manage me. It's blah, 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 blah. But it's like, no, no, no. I want to see if they're also a right fit for me. Because I'm not going to marry someone that, that, that I don't like or something that doesn't work for me. So I, I would encourage you to just think about relationship building in the same way that we think often about um, kind of romantic relationship building, which is kind of go slow see if you like the person and then get married, maybe. Okay, now I'm just checking my time here. Yeah, I'm going a little long, that's okay. Uh, so I wanna talk about email pitches now. And the reality is, is that for most of us, we are gonna do far more email pitching than we are elevator pitching. We are gonna send far more like cold emails to people out of the blue, trying to get an opportunity then, uh, then we will elevator pitch. So the email pitch is, uh, is vital. And I wanted to start, um, I wanted to start just quickly looking at a, a sample email pitch. Now, this is a real email that was sent to a real music manager. Um, and I just want to, I want to just go through this quickly but I'm just curious to see what people think about this email, if it's good, if it's bad, what they like, what they don't. So, hey blank, it's, it's blank here. I originally got your contact from Matt at Fontana, but I also see from Evelyn that you will be attending Music Matters in Singapore. If you have some time, I'd love to connect and grab a drink. I'm a two-time Juno nominee selling over 160,000 worldwide and playing over a thousand shows touring 10 countries. 
My new record came out and I'm looking to develop my career further and love what your team has done with Simple Plan, Finger 11 and Our Lady Peace. My info is below and I'm actually in Toronto this week visiting as I live in LA now, if you are around. Now we're gonna ignore the minor grammar mistakes. That's okay, we are gonna be hostile on that. But I'm, I'm just curious in the chat, do we think that this is a, this is this a good email pitch? Is this a, is this a so-so email pitch? Is this a, a bad email pitch? Give me some, give me some hot takes. Give me some hot takes in the comment section. What do we think? Pretty rough. Feels off. No, could improve. Okay. So pretty forward, very casual, very casual, maybe too casual. Weird order. Weird order. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, so generally it sounds, does, does anybody like it? Okay. Heather says it sounds okay. Um, went, uh, too far romantic relationships. Uh, Iveta thinks it's a little disrespectful. I just like that our lady piece was mentioned. <laughs> yes. Rain Maida is smiling wherever he is right now. Um, so, okay. I am, I am here to tell you that this is a bad pitch. Okay, it's not the worst pitch, but it is a bad pitch. So the first question that I would ask you um, in, in a more kind of general sense is like, what is a pitch? Well, an email pitch is what we might call an ask. You are emailing someone asking for something. I'd like to play a gig. I'd like to have a meeting. I'd like to have you listen to my music and give me feedback. What is the ask in this email? I'll tell you right now, it's very unclear. Does this person want to go for a drink? Does this, people, does this person want to meet me in Singapore? Or do they want to meet me in Toronto? Why do they want to meet with me? What are they looking to do? Do they want me to manage them? Do they want to pick my brain? Um, a, a drink, sure. Uh, now, I will say this on the drink front, I've got two comments on that. So first, first and foremost, um, when do most people do their drinking? Answer, after work. Now, the music business is a pretty, can be a pretty casual place, uh, but more often than not, people on the business side keep normal work hours, right? Nine to five. And so, by asking for someone to go for a drink, you're kind of asking them to work overtime, right? What might be a more professional approach would be, I'd love to come to your offices and get a meeting, or I'd love to you know, bring you a coffee, lunch. Jennifer says lunch. I think that lunch is, it's too soon. It's too soon for lunch. We don't know each other. We could do a coffee where, you know, if, the, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, we can, uh, yeah, we can go do something else. But if you ask me to lunch, it's like, we've got to order and wait for the garlic bread. And uh oh, this is, this is going south soon. Um, so low commitment, okay? Just, just casual. Um, some other comments that I would make about this is that, you know, the stuff about being a Juno nominee, that's good, but I want to know what you've been nominated for right? I want to know where you've played these thousand shows. And I want to know over what period of time, because depending on whether or not it's a thousand shows in 10 years versus a thousand shows in 40 years, well, that's a very different statistic. Okay. But I do like that there's statistics there, but overall, I don't think that this is a great pitch email. Now I am aware of the time, so I, I, I want to get to kind of what is a, a, a really solid, almost bulletproof format for your own pitch emails, okay? And so first and foremost, it's five points, okay? I'm giving you five points now for constructing an email pitch that is going to get you a response, okay? So first and foremost, we'd have a subject line, okay? Now, your subject lines for your emails are actually very important. Um, it may seem like something quite small, but it's actually quite important. 
a lot of people, myself, Jesse, we, we get a pretty high volume of emails within the day. And um, for, for people that are, you know, bigger fish in the pond, like we're talking upwards of 250 to 350 emails a day. If that doesn't stress you out, I don't know what will. But we want to make sure that our subject lines are clear and concise. We say three to five words. I would also say like, what would show up on this screen here? Oh, that's my family. Uh, <laughs> um, what will show up on the screen? Now, this is a place where also you do not want to be too clever, right? I know that we're artists. Let's keep the creativity in the music, okay? Your subject line should be straight and to the point. When I get an email from you, I want to know by the subject line exactly what this email is going to be about. What is the purpose of this email? Opening slot for, book a meeting with, et cetera. Doesn't have to be fancy, has to be to the point. Your goal is to state your purpose and to get someone to open it. So if you've ever sent an email that's like coming soon or you're gonna wanna read this email, you won't believe what happens next. Uh, anything like that, it's actually gonna look more like spam and you're not doing yourself any favors. Okay, so first off, we wanna have a simple to the point subject line. Then we wanna think about our salutation. Now, I know sometimes when we're sending emails, we've gotta send the same email to like 50 different people because we're pitching 50 different people on an opportunity. So there is an impulse to be like, I'm just gonna write one email and kind of send it to everybody at once. That's not a great strategy. I'm just gonna tell you that right now. If someone feels like they are getting a generic email that's just like a templated email that's being sent to them and who knows how many other people, it makes it less important. It's, you know, I would look at it and I would say, well, this email isn't for me, it's for like, a hundred people and someone else will reply. So that's fine. Right. Um, I'll, add, I'll add to that, especially when you're pitching somebody, it's the worst way to uh, make them in uh, unattracted to responding or being a part yeah. of it um, when they feel, when they actually, actually have that feeling. Yeah. So you want to, you want to personalize what you're doing. And the, one of the best ways to do that is with your salutation, right? Reminds me of Charlotte Swift salutations. Anyway, um, be as specific as possible. In our business, it, like I said, it's pretty casual. So using someone's first name is okay. Um, there's no need to, to get extra formal with like Mr. and Mrs. and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, the first name is okay, but it's important that you spell their name correctly. My name is Ryan. I, I sometimes get Brian's emails and I'm sure he's a lovely guy, but that's not me. And I'm a pretty relaxed guy. But I know certain people that have like, you know, common names with uncommon spellings and they take it personal when you don't get it right. I'm thinking about one agent in particular, um, but you want to make sure that you can present it in such a way that it's, it feels customized, right? Now, one thing I will say about the templating thing, it's okay to have like a chunk of standard text that's gonna to go to every person you're emailing, but you wanna make sure that there's enough in it that you can customize it so that it's like, oh, this is an email specifically for me. You wanna personalize. Then in our lead sentence, in our opening sentence, we get right to the ask, right? So when you are coming out of the gate, you know, hi, Jesse, my name is, um, GT, I'm a Mississauga based artist. I am reaching it to you for an op looking for opportunities to perform gigs with CMI. Okay, the ask is right out there, right, right at the top of the email. Now, one thing that I see happen a lot is that people put their asks at the bottom of the email. They, they start off and they say, this is who I am and this is my bio and this is my story and this is these are the places I've been and this is the experiences I've had. By the way, can I book a gig? Um, that's not the way to approach this. I would encourage you to invert that, okay? Come out with your ask 
so that everything that follows can be supported, like can be supporting information for that ask, right? So your lead right. sentence or your lead paragraph gets to the point. So the person reading knows what you're asking them. Jesse knows that you're asking about gigs. Someone else knows that you're asking about a management meeting or whatnot. Um, and as well, it's an opportunity to identify yourself, your style of music. Jesse, what do you want to add? I was just going to comment on, on my end. This is a huge, huge, important aspect of, of a pitch email uh, or just in general when you're pitching people. A lot of people are, for some reason, scared to ask. And when we know you're reaching out to somebody, you know, there's an exchange, there's leverage. Like we'll get into all of that when it just comes to pitching 101. But, uh, but it's so important that you ask it right away. Like the way I usually structure my pitch emails is same thing as Ryan, this salutation. Hey, Ryan, and I go in just like I was talking about that one sentence, who I am, where I'm from, what type of artist, if there's a timbit about me where I'm Juno nominated or, or award winning or just released my single or whatever I'm doing, but something nice and short and quick. And then right after that, uh, I am, I'm right away talking about why I'm, why, what I'm, what I'm doing and what I'm, what, what my pitch is. And, uh, and I would suggest being as blunt as possible too. Sometimes people, when they're, when they're saying their pitch or they're saying their ask, it's kind of like vague, or it's kind of like, if you want to do this, or I don't know, kind of thing. Like I always like to say, try and be as clear and as blunt as possible. Um, and, uh, and I find that works a lot better as well. Yeah. Just, just in, in the words of my therapist, what would happen if you just said it? right? Just come out with it and ask what you're asking for. Because in the body of your email, you're going to elaborate. You know, I'm, I'm pitching, I'm asking for this gig because, you know, I've done all these different shows. I've been here, I've been there, right? Um, it's the opportunity for you. Um, oh, sorry, hang on. I'm just looking at the chat here. Uh, with your email pitch, if you have some connection to them, conference call, do you indicate that first or just pitch right away? Um, Matt, to your question, uh, I think it doesn't hurt to kind of contextualize why you're reaching out to somebody. Um, the one thing that I will give you pause about, though, is uh, don't assume that everybody knows everybody and don't assume that everybody is friends. Okay, so Sometimes a name drop can be helpful, but sometimes it can actually be detrimental, right? My personal preference, um, my personal preference to Matt's question is that if I should, like, let's say I'm trying to reach Jesse and let's say Matt knows Jesse, but I don't. Well, rather than for me to email Jesse and say, hey, Jesse, I got your email from Matt Zaddy, uh, mutual acquaintance. I would actually ask Matt to introduce me to Jesse through email. Okay, it's a subtle difference, but getting in, if, if Jesse and Matt, again, in this theoretical situation, have got a good relationship, if, if Matt says that I'm, I'm good shit, or I'm, I'm like worth taking the email from, if, if Matt says that, then Jesse is gonna be more receptive. People are generally more receptive when someone else is singing your praises than when you are. Okay. Yeah. All so, and uh, my opinion on that too, uh, Matt. I 100% agree with Ryan, especially with the people, because you never know. Um, but it can work out in your favor too. So whereas yeah. if somebody reached out to me and they're like, "Hey, Ryan gave me your contact," I'd be like, "Oh, you're like that's going to help that person, right?" But yeah, if somebody mentioned uh, Kate. No, I'm just joking, Kate. Um, but if somebody, somebody mentioned that I didn't like, then it might be. Um, but I do like if you did have a connection. So maybe it was at a conference or maybe you ran any digital ele ele elevator pitch or there is some sort of um, way that it is. Sometimes it's good to mention that in that first sentence. I wouldn't like expand and write a novel on it, but saying, hey, my name is Jesse and I'm a this type of artist, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I was uh, given your contact by Ryan and just keep it at that, just so there's an aware of it. Or we met briefly at this conference and you gave me your contact and told me to reach out at a certain point. Like kind of um, saying that is is actually, uh, uh, can be a positive workout. And I would recommend Absolutely. it if there is a connection for sure. And then that way, when you're talking in your email with the tone, if you, especially if you have the tone, like you know them, then you want to kind of make note of, of how you might know, not know them. And if you don't know them, that's okay. But just don't act like you do know them and act like this is your first time reaching out. Um, be very clear about that as well. Okay. All right. 
Yeah, Thank Jess you. Jesse's an animated guy, so the, the mic the mic gets abused sometimes. Sorry, everybody. Um, so just just going back to this. So the the middle paragraph, we've we've got a clear subject line. We've addressed it to a person specifically. We've made our pitch, and then in the body, this is why we are. This is how we justify the ask. Okay, so this is why you explain why I'm reaching out to you specifically. This is where you can demonstrate a knowledge of that person. Uh, like in the example that we saw, you know, they did mention some of the artists that the manager was managing. Our Lady Peace, Finger Eleven, et cetera. Um, and that goes a long way. Doing your research, um, doing your research goes a long way because again, it shows me as the email recipient that I'm not just on some mail blast. Like you've taken the time to research me a little bit and say like, hey, I liked what you did here. And uh, I think as we all know, people love being complimented. <laughs> so there's a little bit of an ego stroke at play, but, but more importantly, provide da data or facts to support your pitch. And this is one thing I love, uh, I love to tell people is that you cannot hype a fact. And I know for some of us, you know, I don't know if it's a Canadian thing, I don't know if it's a humility thing, but you know, we might have got a Juno, or we might have won a, we might have won a songwriting competition, or we might have got to open for a very cool band. And at some point it feels like maybe you're bragging. Well, guess what? If it has happened to you, and that is a fact, you are not bragging. Okay, you cannot hype a fact. Hype is when you're like, this is gonna be a game changer. I'm going to the next level, hype, 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 all this like silly hype language. It means nothing and it just makes a lot of noise. But if you have accomplishments under your belt, if you have a resume of, uh, of achievement, do not be shy about that, okay? You've earned those achievements and you should confidently be able to articulate those to other people. You cannot hype a fact, okay? And then finally, when we're closing out our email, we want to sign off. And the sign off, the sign off is important because we we want to try to keep ourselves in control. So a lot of times we might say, hope to hear from you, or like, let me know what you think. And those are fine, I suppose, but they're passive, right? You're saying, like, here's here's my stuff, you know, here you go. Hopefully you get back to me. Um, I would rather be more active and more assertive. So, you know, if I was, uh, if I was say sending materials to Jesse for a potential gig, you know, um, that's happening in a few, in a month or two, I might say like, take, take a week to, to review my materials and I'll follow up with you to see what you think. Right. It's, it's a little bit different, but it, it it keeps yourself in control, right? Um, I've got a bullet here, like, you know, establish how and when you plan to follow up. Again, like, be reasonable. Don't be like, uh, I sent you an email this morning and I haven't heard from you yet. It's five o'clock. It's like, okay, chill out, um, pump the brakes. But, you know, if, if it's like you send someone an email and you say, you know, I'll check back in with you in a week's time to see how, you, how things are going, that's great. Okay. Uh, asking questions can be effective, you know, so like, um, you know, again, in the gig scenario, like, are my materials up to snuff or like, are, is the band entertaining opening slots for this gig? You know, uh, those, those can be good questions that might trigger a response. Um, and as well, never, never presume that things are going to be agreed to. Right. So if I, if I'm emailing Jesse for a gig, I'm not going to be like, uh, and let me know how to advance the gig and I'll send you my stage plots and riders. And also I need a thousand bucks, right? That's not what we're doing here. Again, we're starting to get a conversation going. So the sign off is really about generating a response. And that is really a, a pretty bulletproof format for, for getting out a pitch. Uh, we want a good subject line. We want to personalize with a salutation. Then we want to come in with our ask right away. Why am I e emailing this person? Just say it. What are you asking for? Then support it in the body with research, with facts, with your own accomplishments, and then sign off in a way 
that keeps you in, in, in somewhat of the driver's seat um, rather than being passive and being like, let me know what you think. Say like, you know, I'll, I'll follow up with you in a week's time or two weeks, whatever is appropriate for the pitch. Um, just so that, uh, just so that you can get a response. And I would encourage you if you don't hear from someone to follow up. Um, I, I say je- my, my personal preference is like, I give people like a week to get back to me, like a business week to get back to me. Um, and I may follow up a second time if it's really important to me, but uh, generally I send one follow up, and if that doesn't get a response, I move on. Okay, so don't forget to follow up as well. Okay, I, I got um. There's. Can you guys hear me? Okay, now. Sorry about that. Yes. So there's uh there's three tricks that I always like. Well, I wouldn't call them tricks, but tips that I I always like to uh, make sure that my pitch email uh, is very like has. Uh, so one we already talked about, which was being very blunt and clear with what the ask is. And like Ryan was saying right at the start, like not beating around the bush. This is why I'm reaching out. This is what I want. This is what I'm asking for. Um, and a trick that I like using right after that, as Ryan was mentioning, backing it up with research or information, uh, the trick that or the tip that I like to use uh, is right after I ask, I like to reason myself of the reason why I'm asking that with a compliment of the person that I'm reaching out to and pitching. So for example, if I'm pitching a venue and I'm like, the reason why I'm reaching out is because I would love to book a show at your venue. Your, and then right after I would talk about why I want that. Your venue is one of the best venues in Kingston and it's always been a venue I've wanted to play. Or you know, I'm reaching out to a festival. Your festival is bar none the best festival that's running in Southern Ontario and your lineup is amazing. And what that does is it almost gets the, the person the reader that you're pitching to kind of be on your team where they're like, yeah, you're, you're kind of right. Our festival is amazing. Of course you would want to play it. You know what I mean? And it kind of justifies why you ask it. So when you ask something very blunt and then you justify it in a way that compliments them, they're not going to kind of be like, look at this person asking for the world. They're like, yeah, I, they're complimenting it. I, I feel like it is. And um, not to make it all about relationships, Ryan, but it's kind of like when you're asking a person out and you go, hey, I would love to take you on a date because I think you're very funny and we get along so well. It's, it's kind of justifying the reason of why you ask. Uh, I find it's a great trick. And then you did mention the question part. Uh, I live and die by that in my pitch emails, especially for, for shows and, and, uh, and bookings of that matter. Uh, you know, a, a great example would be if there's a certain date, do you happen to have that date available? Ryan had a great example. Are you still looking for opening slots on that show? Uh, You know, do you have, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I I always love leaving it on a question because what it does is as a reader, when I read that and I go, you know, if I'm, and I'm getting pitched all the time. And if I have an artist or a manager pitching me and they're like, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Have a great day. I kind of read it. I understand what they want. And then I'm going to have a good day. And then I keep going off my day where if there's an, uh, a question like, is that date available? Or have you finished your curation? I just feel more inclined where it's like, you know what, I gotta get back to them, they're asking questions, so let me respond to them. So I find that that trick, the question, it, the response rate uh, benefits so much more um, when I try that. Uh, not all the time, but I find it works very well. Awesome. Uh, so Jesse, uh, yes. I'm gonna throw it over to you now, bud. So Ryan, thanks for, for kind of laying the ground there. And, and in, in everything that we're gonna talk about next, we wanna take these same approaches, these same strategies, these same templates and implement them to the different people that we're pitching, okay? Um, so when it comes to pitching, before I kind of get into the different people that we'd be pitching, the number one thing that I find um, a lot of artists uh, make as a mistake, and not only a lot of artists, but a lot of managers as well, or promoters or agents, um, when they're reaching out to people, uh, and Ryan alluded it to it in an email pitch, they're, they're not concentrating in enough on what they're going to do to benefit the person that they're reaching out to. So if I reach out to a festival or I reach out to a show and I go, hey, I really want to perform at your festival. And the reason why I want to perform at your festival is because I'm trying to gain my fan base or I just released a single and I'm trying to market it right now. If I'm that festival and I hear that, the festival is going to be like, okay, great. Of course you want to play my festival because you just released your single. Of course you just want to play your festival because you're growing your fan base. Our festival is going to do that. But how is our festival going to benefit 
by you by us booking you because that is really not what you've been saying so that's where a mistake that a lot of artists a lot of managers make so the biggest thing that i would like to kind of get across is anytime you are reaching out to somebody especially if you're the one pitching you don't have the leverage the person that's that you're pitching is the one that has the leverage so because of that everything that you should be discussing should be ways that you feel like you're going to benefit them if they do what you want okay so, and you can still use the same thing so you can say i'm building a fan base or I am releasing a single and that's why I'm playing, but it's the way you angle it. So the way I would angle it is say, hey, hey, I want to play your festival. I'm releasing a single. And because I'm releasing a single, I'm going to be promoting it. There's going to be all this noise going on. I'm going to be trying to get all these media interviews and people are going to be talking about it. And there's going to be radio play and all these kind of things that are going to go on. And while that's happening, I'm going to obviously also be promoting that I'm playing your festival at the end of the year or at the end of the summer or whatnot, when all this stuff is going to happen or when people are seeing all this stuff going on because of the single, they're going to see promotion then on the festival. Okay. So that's the way I kind of like to pitch or I like to approach pitching depending on the person that we're speaking to, because really you got to have to kind of speak on how they're going to benefit. And if you don't do that, they're probably not going to be interested. Okay. So Kate, let's get in. Um, to a couple of different types of the shows. So before we get into like the actual approach of how we're gonna pitch them, what they like, it's very key that we kind of know the different types of shows that there are, because depending on the different types of shows, uh, there's different ways on how to pitch them and the things that you wanna be talking about. So there's two main types of shows. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of other ones, but the two main types of shows are hard ticket shows uh, and soft ticket shows. Does anybody want to try and uh, guess what one of them is? Uh, I saw we do, we've done a couple of workshops with a couple of people on this where we explain it, but does anybody want to give a quick shot at what either a hard ticket show is or a soft ticket show? Got uh, physical versus electric, which is, which is not correct, but yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Soft ticket, free event, uh, or fest with multiple acts. Yeah. So all of these are, they're correct. Um, they are 100% correct, but it's true definition. I guess, Kate, we can go to the next slide. Let's just start with a hard ticket show, okay? So if I'm going to go see uh, Arlene, who's on this call, and I'm going to go see Arlene, and she's an artist, and let's say that she's playing the Horseshoe, or she's playing the Rivley, or she's playing the Downtown Mississauga Club, or the Downtown Hamilton Club, and I'm going to go attend that, and I'm going to buy a ticket, it doesn't matter if I buy a ticket from the door. It doesn't matter if I buy a ticket from Arlene. If I buy it online, I'm buying a ticket to go see Arlene play at a specific venue. That would be considered a hard ticket show. Okay. Hard ticket shows, uh, the best way to describe if, you, if it's a hard ticket show or not, those are where you're getting a lot of the promoters that are approaching you as an artist and going, hey, I need you to sell 30 tickets. Or they're asking what your draw is. Hey, how many people can you draw? How many people can you sell? How many tickets can you sell? I'm only booking artists that can sell at least 15 tickets or 20 tickets. We've all heard that before. I can't stand it. Uh, but we've all heard that before by promoters. So anytime you're hearing that by a promoter, that's very much uh, a proven fact that it is a hard ticket show because the financials of a hard ticket show are very simple where you have a venue and you have a show and the show has costs where it's a venue fee. Maybe there's some production or a sound tech. And then you're maybe paying the artist, a door person, but there's expenses. And then basically the revenue is ticket sales. Okay. So you take your ticket sales or your revenue, you take your expenses and what is ever left over is either your profit or your loss. Okay. Um, so that's why it's so, you know, emphasized uh, for hard ticket shows or the setup or the promoters or the people organizing it, that they're so, they're so focused on what the draw is of the artist or how many tickets the artist can sell or how many tickets the actual event is actually going to sell. Okay. Does that make sense? The next type of show is a soft ticket show. Do you want to go to the soft ticket cake? So a soft ticket show is, so let's say same artist. So I'm going to see Arlene and instead of playing like the club, uh, she's going and playing the CNE in Toronto, or she's playing um, maybe a free event at the Mississauga Square uh, or a festival or any type of thing, whether there's a ticket price or not. Um, I'm actually going to see Arlene. And even though I'm going to see Arlene and nobody else, technically speaking, I'm not actually going to see Arlene. I'm going to attend an event that Arlene is performing at. So even if I go to the CNE, 
I'm technically, or sorry, even if I'm going to see and to see Arlene, even if I'm only going to, to see Arlene, I'm not going to do anything else. Technically speaking, I'm going to the c &E, and then I'm going to watch Arlene, okay? So a soft ticket show is more or less where the ticket sales don't relate as much to the event. It doesn't mean that they're all free or it doesn't mean the ticket sales aren't important to the event. It just means the event probably has a carved out budget for artist fee, for ticket sales, and they're not relying as much on the artist to provide the ticket sales as much as the actual event or the attendance, okay? So is there any questions on that a hard ticket show versus a soft ticket show, or what would this show be defined as, or what would that type of show be defined as? The main reason, if anybody asks any question, please please ask, but the main reason why um, it matters so important, the differentiation between the two is because if you're an artist and maybe you don't wanna sell tickets right now, or maybe you're trying to play a market and you can't draw and you don't, you, you can't, you know, you can't sell tickets or it's just something you don't feel comfortable doing right now. It doesn't mean that you can't just not play shows. It just means that you should strategically not be focusing on hard ticket events. And instead, you should strategically be trying to play soft ticket events. Okay. Um, likewise, if there are any genres, and what we find is that depending on your genre, there are certain genres that skew towards more of a hard ticket type of show or a hard type, uh, soft ticket type of show. So, for example, a lot of hard rock bands metal bands, you know, alternative rock bands, that type, they skew a little bit more towards hard ticket events, more or less, where you see a lot of pop artists, hip hop artists, EDM dance music, uh, world music artists, they would skew a little bit more towards soft ticket events. And then you've got your country, your singer songwriter, your folk, and they're kind of going back and forth. There's no real right or wrong way to go. Um, but what we do find is based on your genre or your style, sometimes those styles are more receptive to soft ticket events versus, soft, versus hard ticket events. So for example, soft ticket events, they love pop music or top 40 music because it's safe music. There's not a lot of swearing. The whole household, it's a brand name. The kids might like it, but the family might like it. Um, so that's why they like pop music. Likewise, what they find is there's not a lot of pop music until you get to maybe the Justin Bieber level. Developing pop artists traditionally can't sell a lot of tickets. So because of that, instead of a pop artist going and playing a club or you know, a, a small venue to 100 to 200 to 300 or less people, they would go target a soft ticket event, okay? So that's kind of the main reasons why we wanted to list them. Um, another reason why we say, uh, the, the, another reason why we like to list them is when you're maybe applying for grants or if you're talking to industry members. So again, what this is about, it's more about pitching industry speaking to industry, pitching, getting shows. So if you are in the position where maybe you're speaking to a promoter or an agent or a manager, or especially if you're filling out funding, it, start using these terms, start using hard ticket shows, soft ticket shows. Hey, my strategic plan, my plan right now for touring is to strategically focus on booking soft ticket events instead of hard ticket events until I get to a point where I can play more hard ticket events or something along the lines of that. If you start using those terms, industry and grants are gonna start looking at you a different way as well. So just as far as communication goes, we find it very beneficial to be using those, um, those things, okay? Um, very quickly, another reason why we use the term hard ticket uh, shows and soft ticket shows, there's a term called your hard ticket value, okay? So if anybody ever comes across this term hard ticket value, really what that means is that's your draw, okay? So if I have a draw and I can sell, let's say 30 tickets, at about $10 a piece at a normal club or whatever it may be, technically speaking, my hard ticket value would be $300, okay? So going back to it again, if you're ever in a position where promoters or you're dealing with a hard ticket show type of event and a promoter's like, hey, so Jesse, like how many tickets can you draw? Or you know what, Jesse, I need you to draw at least 20 tickets or you need you to at least sell at least 25 tickets. Instead of answering him or her going, well, I can sell this many tickets or this is what my draw is, what I want everyone to start doing now is start answering with the term, well, my hard ticket value is $300 or my hard ticket value is about 30 people at about $10 a piece. That's the way professionally that you should be answering. And just like using the hard ticket, soft ticket terms, the people that you're answering to are gonna be start looking at you a different way. That promoter that maybe might trying to screw you around or trying to kind of negotiate with you, you start bringing up hard ticket value, they're gonna understand that they probably don't have as much wiggle room or you know what you're talking about, okay? 
Another reason, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Kate, another reason um, why the hard ticket value term is so important is in hard ticket shows, uh, in hard ticket shows, it's kind of the starting base of negotiation when you're pitching and negotiating the artist fee. Okay, so if I'm in a hard ticket event, and remember, we just explained what a hard ticket event is, right? That financially speaking, it's ticket sales, which is your revenue, minus your expenses is going to equal the profit of the show. Okay, so if I have a hard ticket value of, let's say, $300, so I can sell 30 tickets at about $10 a piece, I have a hard ticket value of $300. Is it fair for me to ask for $300 as an artist payment to a hard ticket show? Okay, so if I'm the hard ticket promoter, what that saying is, is if I book this artist for my hard ticket show, there's going to be $300 worth of revenue coming into the show, but the artist wants $300 back. So what that's going to do is it's going to keep me at even. So depending on the promoter, you might have some promoters that are like, hell no, there's no way I want to do that deal because I'm not going to make any money. There might be some other promoters that are going to be like, you know what, I'm not making any money but I'm the in-house promoter of the Horseshoe or the Rivley. So you know what, I'll make my, I'm not gonna make any money at the bar or so I'm not gonna make any money at the door, but I'm gonna have 30 people drinking. So I'll make some money in that way, okay? So depending on who you're speaking to, you can kind of negotiate up and down, but that's really the starting point of where industry members will start the negotiation of uh, the artist fee. So if I'm an agent, if I'm a manager and I'm dealing with a promoter and we're dealing with a hard ticket show, the first thing that the manager or agent and promoter are going to do is dictate what the hard ticket value of this artist is. Once they know the hard ticket value of the artist, then that they use that as the starting point to start the negotiation. Okay. Now, what we find is if you're an artist or if you're working with an artist and you have a higher hard ticket value, you can go ask for actually higher your hard ticket value. So if you have a hard ticket value of let's say a thousand dollars, so you can draw maybe a hundred people at ten dollars a piece. You could probably go request two, you know, two thousand to three thousand dollars for an artist fee. Okay. Now, likewise, if you're an artist and you don't have a hard, hard, high hard ticket value, and let's say you maybe have something a little lower, it might be a little harder to garner it. So, if your hard ticket value is maybe only a hundred dollars, a hundred and fifty dollars, so I can draw ten or fifteen people, you might only be able to be able to bargain and negotiate a couple hundred bucks, if that, and you might only be paying for free, right? So. Anyways, the whole point is, is that's kind of how you start the hard, uh, that's kind of how you start the negotiation when dealing with a hard ticket show, at least when it comes to the, the artist performance fee. Okay. Soft ticket formula. Again, uh, when you're in a soft ticket type of scenario, it's a little harder because again, with hard ticket, it's very simple. It's simple math. It's the revenue minus expenses and that leaves the profit. With a soft ticket event, the good thing about a soft ticket event is you don't really have to sell tickets or the event is not too concerned about selling tickets. They're more concerned about, are you the right fit and all of those things. So when it comes to their fee, they usually kind of have a set budget carved out or a set fee that they are, that they have tapped into. And it has nothing to do with what your hard ticket value is. So as a rule of thumb, what agents and managers kind of do is they'll take their normal hard ticket value of a hard ticket event. They'll double it. And then they'll add the expenses of whatever that show was, okay? So let's say that we're getting approached and we wanna start the negotiation and it's a soft ticket event, it's a city event or something along the lines of that. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna know, hey, my hard ticket value is usually 300, so I'm gonna double it, that's gonna be $600. And then let's say that I gotta pay a band, a couple band members, there might be some travel, some parking, and then there's gonna be again, another, let's say uh, 600 and $650 worth of expenses. What that would add up to would be around 1250. So that's kind of how I would start that is my negotiation. Now, does that mean that I would try and go higher? Maybe I would try and go higher. Does that mean that I would take lower? Maybe I would take lower. I have no problem taking lower than that. I'm just saying that's where I'm gonna probably start my negotiation when we're dealing in that situation, okay? Any questions so far at all? I see there's some questions of where the infos are gonna be available. And, and yeah, this, this will be, um, this is being recorded and we'll be, we host it after. Okay. So um, before we get into all the different types of shows and people, no, you can still go to that, Kate. Um, but before we get into the, the, the different types of shows 
and type of promoters and different type of people that we're going to be pitching and how to kind of go about doing it. Um, an important checklist that I encourage everybody to do is um, take an inventory of, of key things that you think that would help when approaching different types of shows um, that are going to attract them to want to book you. Okay. And think about if you're going to reach out to somebody and they have no idea who you are and you're obviously reaching out because you want to book a show or book a festival and they have no idea who you are, what would be some of the things that you would want to show them? And maybe if not even some of the things you want to show them, but what would be some of the things you would maybe want to have going on that you think that it would be appealing for them to want to book you? Okay. And the best exercise that I would say to do this is think about your own show. So think about if you were putting your own show on, and you had artists that they wanted to play it and they're reaching out and they're like, I want to play your show. And they're reaching out. What would be some of the things that either one, you would want them to send you or two, you would want them to have going on. Okay. So these are kind of the top things. These are not everything. Um, but these are kind of the top uh, things that we find work very well when you're reaching out to people and trying to kind of pitch yourself or, or book shows. Okay. So an EPK, which would be an electronic press kit, which would basically be a, a document that kind of outlines everything about you, access to video, media, pictures, the whole gambit. And a lot of the time, that's a lot of a larger document, okay? Which still works very well. Um, a one sheet, I don't know how many artists here have one sheets, but one sheets are very beneficial. And what that does is you kind of take a lot of the information maybe in the press kit and you take a one sheet. So it could be one sheet or two sheets or a small PDF that very briefly lists the key information, a little bit about you as an artist, and then selling factors, you know, whether it's streaming numbers, show history, testimonials, all these other things that we're seeing here, key, key things that maybe you want to express to the person that's going to be opening this file. That's what you want to get on your one pager. And the cool thing with one pagers and press kits, you can hyperlink to social media, to YouTube clips, to all of that kind of stuff. Okay. One of the probably biggest assets that we find, especially this day and age, um, that works the best is a live performance video. Um, so, uh, you know, we, you know, I always say with the live performance videos, it doesn't have to be DVD level as well. And it doesn't have to be a live set, like a, an entire set. It could be half a song. It could be a, a, a quick intro of a festival. It could be something small. The main thing is, is obviously the quality has to be somewhat re uh, re uh, reasonable. It can't be from the iPhone, but in no way does it have to be um, you know, DVD type of, of level, really what you're trying to get across is um, really what you're trying to get across is what it looks like, what the performance is like, the energy off the stage, how good the performers are. If you can get some fan engagement or fans there or show that, that's golden. But really, that's all you're trying to get across. You're not trying to get across the DVD. You're just getting a, trying to get across what the actual performance is going to look like. In the chat, Jesse, uh, somebody's asking if they can use a music video. Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it, and the one thing I'll say about all of these is you don't need to have every single one of them. And you don't, there's not just one that you need either. I've seen a lot of different combinations work. I've seen some people that they're like, I just use a performance video and it's like a 45 second intro to this and that and it just looks so cool and that's all I need to book I have some people that they need the one sheeter or they need the testimonial so there's no right or wrong answer um, I've seen music videos work very well um, but I see it work a little bit better uh, when proving the music so if I'm sending a song maybe um, because the one thing that a music video does unless it's a live music video and there's a lot of live component to it it doesn't really show what the performance is like right I'm just gonna see what the artist is like I'm gonna see what the brand is like I'm gonna see the genre I'm gonna listen to the music so it's still very very much of a beneficial asset um, but it's still not maybe not getting across what the actual live performance is gonna look like again unless it's one of those videos that's like really hyping up live performances or you see a lot of people do music videos and there's shots of the performance or of the, the artist on tour or whatever it may be. Uh, they can still work, but a traditional kind of music music video, I might still use if it's getting hits or if there's interaction or if there's like a lot of stuff going on with it, but I wouldn't use it for like the live performance video aspect of it. Right, thanks. And that's what I was gonna say. You kind of, if you're pitching for live, you wanna demonstrate what you, what the person that you're pitching to can expect um, from a live performance from you. So you, you, ideally you'd want to either include both or just a live video, if that's what you have. Um, I see a question here. Is it better to pitch directly as an artist or is it better to pitch through a manager or a representation? So um, my whole opinion is it doesn't matter too, too much. 
And, and it really depends where, funny enough, I actually like working with the artist directly. I, I much rather be dealing with the artist. Now, I do know a lot of other promoters that they would much rather be dealing with a manager because with a manager, they can maybe be harder on them or they can say things that are might be a little bit censored before the artist might hear them, They uh, things like that. So um, I would say if you have a manager or you have a representation, I would probably have them do it. So if I have that option, I would go with it. But don't think in any way are you crutched if you are the artist reaching out. Um, uh, in no way is that going to crutch you in any way. Yep, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Show history, funny enough, is actually a huge one, and we'll get into that in the different types of places that show history would work. But I highly recommend every artist, if you've been on tour, if you've done shows, track that stuff, track when they were. Um, that is great data, especially depending on the people that you're reaching out to. Someone like myself, I love seeing that. That is one piece that really sells me over is, is show history. Uh, same thing with awards, achievements, testimonials, reviews. All of these things are amazing, right? And it depends on how you use them, especially, again, with the upcoming releases, with the social media, with the streaming. That stuff's great, but it's all the way that you, you say it and the way that you can use it in your pitch. So we already talked about upcoming releases. You can't just say, I have an upcoming release. You got to say, I have an upcoming release, which means that there's going to be a lot of noise going on, which means if you book me for your show, there's going to be all these other things that are going to be able to use as platforms to help promote it. On a social media standpoint, if I have 10,000 followers and 80% of my followers happen to be fans of that headliner, when I'm reaching out, I might be able to use social media, not just the fact that I have 10,000 followers, but the fact that I have 10,000 followers and 80% of them are direct fans of that headliner. That is direct marketing that that promoter or that show is going to have access to. So the way that you explain it, you can use this, these, these, these items um, to your advantage in your pitch, right? Um, I think I've made the point. The main point is, is there's a lot of different ones. As an artist, you don't have to have all of them. Focus on the ones that are strongest. And while you're doing shows, always continue to build them. Always continue to build those reviews and those testimonials and the show history. If you can get live footage, don't think that it's all going to happen with your first show. Start building that and, and, and get it to grow. We call it war chess. Um, agents call it ammo for some reason. I hate the reason why they call it that. Um, but agents call it ammo as in like, Jesse, I got the gun. I can shoot it really well, but I need you to provide me the ammo. Otherwise, nothing's going to work. And basically what they're saying is, Jesse, I can sell really well. I know all the people to sell to. But if you're not giving me stuff that I can go sell, it doesn't matter how good I'm at selling. We're not going to get anywhere here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's up for the artist to start getting that information and getting these assets to help them, you know, with these pitches and, and, uh, and going after it. Okay. So with that said, let's just start going into the different types of shows. Uh, is it good to have a team? No one can, uh, it, it is good to have a team. No one can do everything. Yep, 100%. We get questions this, I don't know if there's any managers on this um, session or not, but a lot of managers like, is it the role of the, is it role of the manager to book shows? And no, it is not the role of the manager to book shows. We're gonna get into agents. It's the agent's role to book shows. But if there's no agent involved, then the role of the manager is going to probably be to book the shows. So until there is a role, the manager's got to do it. And I say the same thing with an artist. If there's no manager, then it's the role of the artist to go book the shows. If you don't have a manager to go do it, or you don't have someone to go book the shows, then it's the artist's role. Um, so Veronica, I do, I do hundred percent agree with you that on that front as well. Um, uh, for sure. So let's just get into, uh, let's get into the different type of shows, the different type of people you might be pitching, uh, what I find they like, what I find they don't like, um, when to pitch them. If anybody got any questions, feel free to ask them and we can go back to them and whatnot and, uh, and we'll go from there, okay? So let's start with pitching hard ticket promoters. We kind of got into it already. We know what a hard ticket promoter is, right? So what do they care about? They care about your hard ticket value. So when you're pitching out and you're reaching and you're going through our pitch templates that we just went through, you're doing your elevator pitch, it doesn't matter how good you say you are is an, a band or an artist, you could be the best band in the world performance wise, but if you can't draw or you don't have a hard ticket value or you're not talking about your hard ticket value, you're probably not gonna interest that uh, promoter. Unless you can relate to how good you are, that's gonna make you draw people and, or, or build that hard ticket value. So it's very key when you are, promote, when you are pitching hard ticket promoters, when you're, when you're 
when you're communicating to them, you're going to have to talk about that. Okay. Now, if you don't have a good hard ticket value, sometimes what artists will do is they might talk about other ways that they can promote the show. So again, maybe I don't have a good hard ticket value, but I'm amazing at promoting and I work my ass off and I do this and I do that. And I'm going to put Facebook ads up. And back in the day, I used to love this trick where I'd be like, I'm going to go poster the, the town and I'm going to go do all these things. And I'm going to go hang out at the skate park and I'm going to go promote the hell out of this show. So yes, my hard ticket value might be low, but I'm going to do all of these other things where I hope that other people might indirectly come to the show because of that. Okay. Now, if I'm a hard ticket promoter, that might not get me to say yes right away, but you know what? It sure as hell make me more interested in this person. And I might want to take a risk on this person because you know what? They're taking it seriously. They're talking about what I care about and they're trying to figure out a solution here. Um, so that's the kind of approach that I like to take on hard ticket promoters on that front. We have another slide that talks about secondary markets uh, that are like, you know, markets that maybe we haven't played in before. Maybe we have absolutely no hard ticket value. We'll get into those in a second on how to pitch them as well. But generally speaking, for hard ticket shows, that's the approach that you got to take. So if you don't want to take that approach or you don't want to speak that language, or if you don't think that you have enough stuff going on to prove that, um, you're going to have to reconsider going after these type of shows or pitching these type of people. Okay. Let's get into the next one. Okay. So pitching soft ticket promoter. So it's funny. It's kind of the exact opposite where a hard ticket promoter, again, you could be, I don't want to say this, but you could be very, very uh, not good performance wise, but you could have a hard heart, uh, sorry, a high hard ticket value. And that promoter would probably still be interested in booking you. Okay. Whereas with a soft ticket promoter, they very, very do much care about quality control. Um, they also care about quality control based on their genre. So what I find with most soft ticket events, the biggest thing that they care about is they already have a built in audience and they want an artist that is going to be able to obtain and entertain that artist and engage them. So if I book that artist is my target demographic audience that's going to be there. Are they going to, are they going to like that artist? Are they going to know that artist? And if they don't know that artist, are they going to like that style of music? Okay. So if I'm a soft ticket promoter and you see like the car show and the car show, generally speaking is like older demographic, a little bit more skewed towards males that are kind of like blue collared and this and that. That's why when you go to every car show, you don't really see like maybe like a, uh, a younger demographic artist, you see like a classic rock artist, or you see a heritage artist, or you see one of those artists that are playing. It's not that that's how they got booked. It was actually premeditated by that soft ticket event. If I'm running, um, the best example of a soft ticket event was, did anybody remember like Canada 150? And when we turned 150 and, and Canada did all, did all those 150 shows, those were like the definition of a soft ticket event. And if you saw all those artists, they were all very much soft ticket artists. Those were artists that were booked where the whole family could show up and know them. Cardinal Official is probably the biggest Canadian soft ticket artist that we have where Cardinal Official probably couldn't go play the clubs across Canada and, and, and play a club tour across Canada, but he can pretty much play any market he wants performing at soft ticket events. And a lot of people will go show up and he'll garner a lot of, uh, a lot of um, artist guarantees for that because he's so much in demand of soft ticket events. OK, um, soft ticket events, they do like to work with professional people. Um, they're very worried because they're a lot of the time, maybe not, um, you know, 100 percent in the music industry. They might be volunteers. They might be a committee. So a lot of the time when they're booking the artist, they want to make sure that this artist is professional. They're not going to screw them over. They're going to be on time. They don't know what they're getting into. So they are for sure looking for a professional artist. Um, and that's kind of the main stuff. So again, when pitching soft ticket promoters going into it, these are the things that you want to stress. You don't really want to care too much about hard ticket event. I mean, your hard ticket value, you can talk about it, but the hard ticket show promoter is going to care about your hard ticket value with the soft ticket promoter. I'm talking more about my genre, how I relate to that type of target audience and proving it with stats or show history or similar events that I've done it. I want to talk about how my music can resonate through all of the different types of audiences that's the type of stuff that I'm going to be talking about, um, or at least pitching myself when I'm pitching uh, soft ticket promoters. Okay. Okay. Festivals. Um, before I get into a festival, what do you think a festival is? Do you think a festival would be defined as a soft ticket event? Or do you think a, a festival would be um, defined as a hard ticket event? 
Soft ticket. Okay, soft ticket. Yeah, they can be both. Yeah. So all kind of right. Yeah, it depends on the spot. Yeah. So all these answers are right. And it really depends on the situation. So technically speaking, um, on paper, or actually technically speaking, just in technically speaking, fine, it is a soft ticket event. When I am buying a ticket, it doesn't matter which artist I'm going to see, I'm buying a ticket and I'm going to see that festival. And I'm actually attending the festival. I'm not attending that artist's show. So yes, it is a soft ticket event. But when it comes to the financial setup, a lot of the time of a festival, not every festival, but a lot of them, um, not the free ones, but the ticketed ones, a ticketed normal festival, that would be, that would be uh, on paper or on financially speaking, very much a hard ticket event where those festivals, they care about ticket sales. They care about how many people are buying tickets. They're looking at their bottom line and they're taking their revenue minus their expenses and whatever's left over is their profit. So because of that, they're kind of a hybrid where when they're talking to you, they still care about all of the similar things that a soft ticket event would care about. But deep down when they're making the decisions, it's going back to how many ticket sales will this attribute to or how many people, if it's a free show, how many people will this obtain? Um, does that kind of make sense for most people? So when it comes to festivals, I'm talking about the soft ticket stuff. I'm talking about how good I am live. Um, but at the same time, I'm, if I have a hard ticket value, I'm going to talk about that and I'm going to use that to my advantage. If I don't have a hard ticket value, I might still talk about all of the things that I have going on that's going to allow that festival to use me to go obtain um, ticket sales. So for example, if I'm an artist and I have access to media, or again, I have good social media, or I have a single being released coming up, or any of that kind of stuff, I can go to the festival and I can go, listen, when you book me, you can say that you, you know, you booked the Polaris prize winner of 2021. You can say that you booked a Juno nominated artist or a Juno, you know, a Juno winning artist. Um, you can say that you booked an artist and you know that that artist, if I'm that festival and I booked this artist and I know that festival is promoting their single and they have a, 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 an amazing PR company that's, 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 that's behind them. And it's going to be getting all these interviews and all of these things going on. When that artist is going to be doing all those interviews, they're going to be talking about the festival that they're playing at the end of the year. All of that stuff to the festival, that's free advertising. That's free marketing. That's free direct marketing. So that is the type of assets where maybe I don't have a hard ticket value. Maybe I'm going for those opening slots, but I still have a way that I can benefit this festival and allow them to maybe market it. Um, the best way I like to use it is maybe you can get a interview in a newspaper or on a local radio station. And if I get that interview and I promote that I'm playing that festival where I'm playing, um, playing that show, that festival will probably have to spend a couple thousand dollars to get advertisement on that radio station. Or if they've got to do a print ad in that, that magazine or that newspaper, they're going to have to spend a couple hundred bucks where if you're getting an interview and you're going to be in the magazine and you're already promoting that festival, people might see that festival. They might see the headliner and then they go buy the ticket because they're fans of the headliner. Okay. Um, let me go see the questions. Oh, Ryan, you answering those ones? Yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just I'm just grabbing questions in the uh, in the chat. So don't yeah. worry about that. So, I, so correct. There are a lot of um, so there is a lot of shows. And again, these would be soft ticket events that there is funding behind them or there's a carved out budget. And again, that goes back to it with those situations or those type of events. That type of event is going to have a carved out budget for artist fee. They're going to be less concerned about your hard ticket value. They're going to be more concerned about, are you the right fit? Are you going to benefit the overall goals and objectives of that event? And then if that's the case, when it comes to the fees, it's not going to be based on your sales. It's going to be based on what they have carved out already. Okay. Uh, okay. Opening slots. This one, uh, this one comes up a lot. So opening slots, the key, key trick to opening slots is they are very hard to attain, but they are not impossible. The key trick is to understand who has access to the opening slots and based on who those people are, how you approach them and benefit them. Okay. So how are the ways a promoter? A lot of the time will have access to opening slots. So we were just talking about promoters. We talked about hard ticket promoters. We talked about soft ticket promoters. So depending on the promoter, if I'm talking to a hard ticket promoter and I'm trying to get an opening slot on their show, if it's a hard ticket show, then I'm probably going to be talking about my draw. And that's probably going to be who that promoter's wanting to book. They're probably going to want to book a, uh, an artist that has a great draw. If I am the agent or the label, 
Maybe they don't care as much about draw, but maybe they care about hooking up one of their baby artists the next time the artist comes in. So I've used this trick before where it's like, hey, agent, can you hook me up with this opening slot? If you do that, I'm a very, very well drawing or I have a hard high ticket in that market. So when your other artist comes through and they don't have somewhere to play, they can open up for me. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. What am I doing? I'm basically describing how I'm gonna benefit that agent if they can help me out with my request, right? Labels, managers, bands, find the person that has op the access to the opening slots. And from there, pitch yourself on what they require, or what they're gonna benefit or how you can benefit them, okay? Um, pitching theaters, okay. Same kind of question, I know we're running out of time, but uh, who here thinks that a theater is a soft ticket show or a hard ticket show? So do you think a theater is a hard ticket show or a soft ticket show? Anybody? I have once again, hard ticket. Yep. So after, yep. So again, the reason why I asked is because they are a little bit of a hybrid. So festivals and theaters are a little hybrid. So traditionally speaking, again, it is a hard ticket event because what am I doing? I'm buying a ticket to that theater and I am going to watch that one performer. There's really nothing going on. I'm not really going to buy a ticket to the theater. I'm buying a ticket to the, the like the theater is the show, right? Um, so because of that is a hard ticket show. Now, a lot of the time, what you got to remember with most theaters is theaters do a lot of their bookings and their ticket sales um, seasonal as, and also as group packages. So let's take the um, Mississauga Living Arts Center. Let's take the Rose Theater in Brampton. Um, all of those Southern, Unfit, Southern Ontario theaters, the way that they do their bulk buys is a lot of the people, they buy season passes. So I'm just going to buy this seat for all of the shows this season. Okay. And I, I forgot the percentage of it, but it's pretty high. It's like 60 or 70% of most theaters bookings is coming from seasonal passes. So what that shows then is a lot of the people that are attending that show, they are not really buying a ticket to go see Sammy Jackson at the Rose Theater. They're buying a ticket for all of the events and they're going to see Sammy Jackson because they've already bought a ticket. So with that said, that is a soft ticket event. Um, so again, it kind of, depending on the situation or whatnot, it kind of goes all the place. So the key things that I would say with theaters, very hard to book them. There's a couple of tricks that I would say, it's very hard. You can only really go through the opening act. And the problem is, is that a lot of theaters, they don't like to book opening acts because they like to have the headliner play and put an intermission in between. And then by that time, they've already kind of located all of their staff. A lot of the time it's union. So depending on the, the amount of hours they're putting in, it's very high cost. So they like it very quick, short and simple. So because of that, unless the agent or the manager or the actual show is including um, a opener, a lot of the time there isn't going to be an opener. Okay. Now, because of that, what do they care about then is they care about your hard ticket draw. So they are going in a theater is going, we have a thousand tickets or we have a thousand seats. How are we going to sell this out? And that is why a lot of the time when you see the programming of theaters, they are trying to program high level stuff at that level. They have higher budgets. They're taking a higher risk, but they are actually asking as acting as a high tick, a uh, hard ticket promoter. Okay. So the tricks that I use with theaters is there's two one they all do their bookings at the same time so if you can squeeze into one or two go approach all of the others at the same time because i know a lot of theaters where they're like oh this artist is playing that theater that theater and that theater i'm just going to book them also because they're doing their tour or a lot of artists they'll do a theater tour where they're just like they're packaging and they're playing all the theaters in southern ontario and what all those theaters in southern ontario do is they all go and they're all part of a committee and they all go pitch the agent or the manager on bulk bookings. So they will come to a manager of an artist that they want and they'll like have a meeting and they'll go, you know what, like um, Tom Cochran, we really want Tom Cochran. We all can make him work. So let's go to Tom Cochran's manager. And instead of all of us approaching at the same time, uh, like all of us approaching different times, let's just all approach and go, hey manager, we're gonna book you 10 different times and we're gonna pay you for 10 shows. So you're gonna get us a cheaper rate because you're gonna get 10 shows and we're all gonna book at the same time and they're all gonna they're all gonna be like perfectly aligned. And that's why you kind of see those tours and that's why artists will drop their fees. So that's what theaters are doing. So because of that, if you're able to start booking theaters or if you find that you're starting to get into a couple or a couple locals, 100% go approach them, take that show history, 
take the testimonials and use that. And you might have a good shot getting into theaters. Otherwise, the route that I like to take is I like to go to the theaters and approach playing their uh, lobbies because especially with this reactivation, and I've been seeing a lot of theaters do this. I mean, they haven't really started, but they've been talking about it, is they're gonna wanna start having um, either right before the doors open while people are getting drinks and food, they're gonna wanna have artists performing. And then, um, and then during the intermission, they're gonna wanna have artists performing as well. Um, again, think of what type of setting that would be. That would be more of a soft ticket event you would probably have to be a little skilled back. But if you think that that's your type of setting or you think you could excel in that, I, I highly recommend building either one pagers or building these, these documents to reflect that because I do think there's gonna be a huge blitz into theater booking on that level um, on the developing side. Okay. Um, you can see we're running, uh, we're about 10 running minutes Running out of time, over. okay. So, yeah, but I think that we're, we're okay to keep going. I just want folks to know that if they have to leave you're more than welcome to and don't feel like it's rude, but we're, we'll keep going for another 10 minutes or so. And uh, if you want to stick around, you're more than welcome to. For sure. And um, I'll go to the next one. Okay, so we'll make it quick. So um, we'll go to the next one. So online performances, uh, th these are coming into play. The biggest thing that I would say with online performances is it comes down to views and engagement. A lot of the time with these people or these curators or the people that are booking artists, especially if they're paying artists, they are looking for ways that artists are going to be engaging online. They're going to have potential views. And if they don't have potential views, they have a lot of stuff going on, then it's going to make a social media splash. Okay. So that is a lot what they're caring about. So that's why social media numbers, show history, streaming data, all of these come into play when you're going and reaching out and pitching online performances, you're going to have to be able to prove somehow whether a performance that you've already done that has analytical numbers, or if you have no performances done already, your analytical numbers on social media or certain things in engagement, weighing to prove that, that's, that's kind of how you pitch those people. Okay. Um, we'll go to the next one, Kate. So secondary markets, um, same thing. Again, these are mainly hard ticket promoters. Uh, so the trick that I like to use with secondary markets is you got to remember that they do care about your hard ticket value. They do care about drawing tickets and selling tickets, but in secondary markets, they have a harder time filling up their dates compared to like GTA. So Mississauga, Toronto, all those kind of things. Toronto, there's so many artists. There's so many people wanting to play Toronto. But when you go to Kingston and you think about the amount of venues that are in Kingston and you multiply the amount of shows that they're doing each week, the amount of slots that they have, they don't have enough local artists compared to the slots that they have. So because of that, if you're an artist and you want to play secondary markets, depending on how you're pitching yourself and depending on the plan that you have, you probably have a good chance at, at, at being able to pitch these hard ticket promoters, even if you don't have a good hard ticket draw at this moment. And if that's the case, when you're pitching them, try and go to it with the approach that you have a plan on how you can build it. So, hey, you know what, Ryan, you're a venue manager in Kingston. I have no hard ticket draw in Kingston right now, but if you can help me out, and this is the plan, you're gonna book me, I'm going to work my ass off. I'm probably not going to draw too much, but I'm going to, I'm going to go to that market. I'm going to stay around. I'm going to meet friends. I'm going to do all this promotion. I'm going to get interviews. And then you're going to book me two months later. And, and I might be only be able to draw five people the first time, but the second time I'm going to draw seven people. And the third mm -hmm. time I'm going to draw 12 people to the point where in a year from a, a now or two years from now, I'm going to have built this market where I can draw 30 or 40 or 50 people. And when that happens, I'm not going to go to your competition. I'm going to stay with you. And what that shows is that venue is like, okay, one, I already have a hard time filling up my calendar. So here's an artist that can help me do that. And two, at the end of it, I might have another artist that can draw really well and has a good hard ticket draw. Um, so that's the way I like to kind of play that one. Um, I find it works very well with hard ticket promoters. You got to remember that. The other trick with secondary markets is um, have the impression sometimes that you're on tour. So like with Kingston, I like to be like, Hey, yeah, we're just on our, uh, 401 tour right now. And it just so happens that we're going to be in Kingston on these three dates. So if you happen to have a date available, we would love to take advantage of this opportunity of us being in there. And what's going to happen is that, that, that club is going to be like, Oh, you know what? Awesome. I'm going to get them on their tour and they're going to be promoting it. And they kind of feel like they're taking advantage of the fact that you're on a tour or you're one of those bands. Like, what Ryan was saying, like facts, you know, don't, don't worry about selling yourself. You kind of have to sell yourself 
But if you have these stats or, hey, I'm on tour and we're playing these gigs or we've, played, we've got these four shows booked and we're looking to add a Peterborough or a Kingston or whatever, that stuff works very well with those secondary markets. Very, very well. Uh, and then, Kate, just the next slide then. Okay, so this is the last one. So just before anything, we brought up the term agents. A lot of people know what an agent is, but what is an agent? An agent's sole responsibility um, is to book the artist shows and not only book the artist shows, but book the artist shows for revenue and to make money. Because the only way that an agent would make money is based off a of commission of the revenue that they're able to bring in on artist bookings. So if I'm an agent and I book you and you make a thousand dollars on that gig, I would be taking 10% commission. And that's kind of the normal fee for an agent. 10% um, is the industry standard. I know a lot of agents and they will ask for 15 to 20% which is a little high, but on the developing side, sometimes it takes a little bit more energy and a lot more resources and time and effort to book developing artists. Whereas an artist that's very well known, a lot of times one of the easiest things for an agent to do um, is to book a well-known artist. But for the other ones, it's a little harder. So because of that, they might ask for 15 to 20%. So if you're ever in the situation and they are asking for that, it's okay. Generally speaking though, the industry standard is 10%. But because of this, a lot of artists, they want agents because what that means is you have somebody in your corner and their sole responsibility is to book you gigs and to get you money for gigs. Okay. So we get a lot of the time. How do you pick an agent? When to pitch an agent? How to go about doing it? Okay. So the first thing that we would say is like with an agent, a lot of the time, the, 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 the time that you're going to be ready for an agent is when you are booking shows and it's easy to book shows and you're garnering, you know, revenue from that. Okay. Um, and it's proof of concept. You've done it. And it's getting, almost getting to the point where so much is happening where you need to offload it to somebody. That is a lot of the time that an agent would be probably most wanting to be involved with you. And if not that case, I always say that agents are very good at finding you. It's their job to be keeping track of what artists are doing and all of that. So I like to take the approach to not reach out and pitch an agent on signing on getting signed. I like to reach out to agents and I do it with all of them. And I would encourage all artists to do this, reach out just to let people know who you are and what you've got going on. And we just went through the elevator pitch. You don't have to ask them to sign. You can just say, Hey, I just want you to keep track of what's going on here. And if you see an opportunity or an opening slot or a show that you need help in, I would love the opportunity to show you what I have. And I know so many artists and that's how they get signed where they don't approach an agent, but they just stay in contact with them. And from that, that's kind of how they go about doing it and get and getting pitched on it. Okay. But the best way to impress an agent is all of those pitching materials that we talked about. If you have those and you have them proper and you have them to the point where they are all working a hundred percent, you can go take that into an agent. And that's what you want to pitch your agent to. So if Ryan's an agent, I'm not going to talk about how good I am live. I'm going to talk about how good I am live. And because of that, every show that I play, the promoter keeps on trying to book me and they, they ask me for, and they, they keep on asking me and they keep paying me even more money because they just want me to come back. That's what an agent wants to hear. An agent doesn't want to hear your good live. They want to hear your good live. And that means that this is happening, which is going to allow them because if I'm an agent and you're good live, I don't give a heck care. But if you're so good live that the promoter keeps on asking you, that's great because then I can just go to all these promoters and go book you. And that shows that there's something working. Okay. Um, sorry for speaking so quickly. Uh, I hope we got through a lot of it. Um, we can stick around. I mean, I'll stick around for another five or 10 minutes because I did go through a lot of that quickly. So if there's a slide that you want us to go back on or anything along the lines of that, we're happy to do so. Um, but it was a pleasure going through all of that. It's always fun talking shows and pitching. Um, and if you're ever in those situations and you need our help or want a question or want to reach out or, hey, can you look at this pitch email and dissect it? I mean, we love doing that stuff. So don't ever think you're, you're being a bothering or, or anything like that at all. Uh, Jesse, there's a question uh, in the chat. Just any tips? DJ, yeah. uh, so D DJs yeah. and producers, yeah. yeah. So DJs and producers, a couple things. I like them for soft ticket events a lot. Soft ticket events, uh, 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 DJs work great for that. Um, and then if you are going to be playing the festivals, because there are a lot of festivals that are EDM festivals that are booking DJs, it's the exact same approach where, again, they might not care about your hard ticket value, but if they if you don't have that hard ticket value, what are the other ways that that, that 
festival can use you to market it. So maybe you have a hot song on the radio right now. Maybe you have a really good underground draw. Maybe that there's a lot of people and they're, they're, there's articles on you. Um, I didn't bring this up, but does anybody see on social media where they like top 10 breakout artists to watch this year, top 10 artists in Ontario, top 10 Toronto based artists that are going to be breaking out this, like all those kind of things. I hate that stuff, but that stuff is so good to use for booking shows and festivals because a festival can be like, perfect. I can, while promoting it, say that I booked this. Um, I always yeah. use Havaya Mighty, who's from Brampton, um, as the perfect example this year where she just won the Polaris Prize this year. And I say like Havaya, she can pretty much book any festival, any theater, any show that she wants. It's just going to come down to dollars and cents of like the budget and if it can work out or not. But as far as interest goes, any type of show or festival would love to say, hey, part of our festival is also the Polaris Prize winner this year. You know what I mean? And that's why Polaris matters so much. That's why Junos, I always say like, even if you get Juno nominated or if there's any awards, accolations, that kind of stuff, that's what, yeah. it, it works so well. And that's why it's so key, as Ryan mentioned earlier, to use that in your intros, to use that in your bios, to use that in your elevator pitches. It's not corny, it works so well. Yeah, and if, if I could just add one, one more thing, um, I know, I know we've gone long. So if anybody wants to hear me talk um, on the, on the DJ thing, particularly, but, but really in a broad sense, like when it comes to, to gigs, it comes to building a business. Um, a lot of it is going to, is going to track back to whatever your goals are, right? Whatever goals you have, if you, you know, so like if the tips are for, for DJs, well, the question that I would ask is like, well, what are you trying to achieve as a DJ? Are you trying to license beats? Are you trying to fill a, you're trying to fill a club, right? Like whatever your goals are, that, that should be what dictates your strategy. Unfortunately, <clears throat> this isn't a business where, you know, um, if you do X, Y, and Z, you will achieve success. Um, success is ultimately going to be defined by the individual, by the artist, by the team, uh, whatever they're working towards. So, um, you know, I, I would, it, it, not to be infuriating, but I would often answer a question with a question with like, well, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? Because until you know what that is, um, it's very difficult to plan. Uh, and it's very difficult to move forward because you're essentially moving. You're, it's like you're, it's like you're driving without a roadmap, right? You need you need the goal. You need that destination to dictate, you know, which road you'll take. Yeah. Can I can I say one other thing and not to talk so much, <laughs> though, but this is just one tip because we're talking pitching. Um, Ontario-based festivals. I highly recommend watch the funding that's going to be coming out in the next year or so. Um, and that is the best way to, to find these festivals. So before the pandemic, there was a grant called the Celebrate Ontario Grant and all of the festivals in Ontario would apply for that grant. It was actually a tourism based grant because festivals in general, they attract tourism. People go on and go travel cities, OVO Fest, the amount of people that come from the state. So like the OVO Fest was in heat because the government was giving them so much money through the tourism, but it was because all these people from America and across the world would fly into Toronto go to our hotels, buy our food, go shopping. Anyway, so it was a tourism grant. But what I always said was because it's government funding, they actually have to list the recipients. So if you went every year and you looked up the Celebrate Ontario grant, you would see all the Ontario grants, all of these so small uh, farm festivals and corn fests. But then you would also see like the Dragon Boat Festival and they need entertainment. Or you would see like CMW, which were like more music industry. But you see all the festivals that got funding, how much funding they got, their website, and also um, when they were operating. It was just like a PDF that you could download. So like I always recommended going on that end. But likewise, there's a couple other grants. So Factor has a grant for, for promoters and festivals coming out. And there's another one that just, they, they, they announced the recipients about a, a month and a half ago. It was called the Reconnect um, grant as well. And a lot mm -hmm. of organizations and programmers got that. Um, so that's a great way to kind of see which festivals are getting funding out there. Because you know that means they're going to probably be happening. They're going to have funding. They're going to, you know, those are the ones that I want to first target. Um, so watch the funding and, and, and I, and I highly uh, expect that there's going to be even more funding, not only provincially, but on a federal level. So as an artist, 
don't just kind of go, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm an artist. I got to go apply to this stuff. I'm like, tag that. Let me see when they announce that. And I'm watching that stuff because as soon as they announce it, it's like, I'm going to see all those festivals that got money and I'm going to go target that. I'm going to pitch them. Perfect timing to go pitch them. That's a awesome. brilliant point. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I think, I think we can call it there. Perfect. I think right. so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Ryan and Jesse. This was amazing. And I'm so glad we took the extra time because you had so much information to share with us. And it sort of harkens me back to, to my life before Mac and makes me a bit nostalgic <laughs> to get back into the music <laughs> agent business. But uh, yeah, so thank you so much for that. I know everyone yeah. had a had a great time and was frantically taking notes. So hmm. uh, yeah, and if, and if I could just add, um, you know, if, if anyone's interested in, in CMI or the programs that we offer, you know, I'd suggest follow us, following us on socials at CM Incubator. Um, you know, Susan, maybe you can share that with yeah, wherever, sure. the wherever the video is going to live. Um, you know, we, we post tips and stuff like that on our, on our socials um, as well. You know, check out our website. We do have different kinds of programs. You know, we're, we're here to help today. We're not here to sell our programs, but if, um, if you're interested in learning more about our organization, the kind of work that we do with artists and industry professionals, um, you know, uh, take a look at our socials, take a look at our website, um, shoot us an email, we'd be happy to talk. Amazing. Okay. All right. Perfect, thanks again. And so yes, Kate is sharing the at CM Incubator everywhere and we shared the website, canadasmusicincubator.com. Um, mm. So, definitely check them out. They have amazing resources and they're lovely people as we, as we learned tonight. So please reach out and learn as much as you can. And I just want to extend a huge thank you um, to everyone who showed up tonight. I think we had a great time and uh, we really appreciate you coming out to our TD Culture Lab webinar. This is the last one of the season, but we do have previous webinars available on our website. So you don't have to stop learning. Um, so thanks again, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.